know about the beat about the beat application. We'll share some of that. Um, and then we'll kind of talk about what's your action plan. Like what are what are some things you can you can take an ac action on right away um, to get the ball rolling. So bead, um, you know, in a nutshell, it is the infrastructure piece of solving the digital divide. Um, it's a federal program. They're um, basically the the feds have allocated money to the states and uh, our state broadband office, my high, is going to run a sub-grant sub program. Um, so localities can uh, apply for that. Um, and that can be a variety. It could be, you know, private ISPs that apply. It might be a public-private partnership between, um, you know, a local government or a nonprofit and a for-profit company, or if there are actually some, some organizations in the state that are that are looking into municipally owned and operated networks as well. So that's BEAD. We can come back if you want to dig into it. We're going to talk just a little bit also about the Digital Equity Act. Um, it was the funding for DEA was passed in that same big funding bill that funded BEAD. There are three different pieces of the Digital Equity Act. The first two are funding for the state. Uh, there was funding for them to create a digital equity plan, and then there's funding that allows the state to create the capacity to provide digital equity programs. Most of us are focused on the third program, which is gonna be a competitive program that almost anybody can apply for. We don't exactly know when that application is going to open. It's probably sometime in the later part of 2024. We'll talk a little bit more about that later, but you may see some references to it as we talk about B because really they were they go hand in hand, especially here in Michigan. All right, so this is a busy timeline. I'm going to talk you a little bit through how things are shaking out here in Michigan. So, uh, Bead initial planning funds were given to the state uh, back almost a year ago. I'm sorry, not almost a year ago, <laughs> back in 2022 at the end of the year. And um, they have uh, until, um, well, at the end of this year, they have an initial proposal that's going to be due to the NTIA, which is the administering authority over BEAD, that kind of lays out exactly how MAHA is going to run their BEAD subgrant program. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. You'll see there on June 26th, allocations were made to the state for bead funding. So Michigan got just shy of 1.6. Um, I'm sorry, I just suddenly thought it can't be billion, can it? And it is. <laughs> just at that moment, I'm like, I can't, I can't talk about billions in Michigan, can I? Yes, I can. All right. Um, you'll see there on August 28th is the next milestone for bead. As far as my high is concerned, they have to turn in a five-year action plan. Now we'll talk a little bit more about the five-year action plan in a minute. Um, that's not uh, what most people might be hoping for, which is going to lay out how do we participate in this program? How's it gonna work? How do we you know, maximize our chances at getting funding? It's really more of a foundational document that kind of lays out a, a framework upon which all those details will be hung at a later date. You'll see here on 11.23 that um, this is a guess. You'll see there's a couple dates on here with question marks. So my high has not announced that they're planning to do these things on these dates. I am looking at the federal uh, policy and the policy guidance that have come from NTIA, and I'm working backwards from deadlines that they have. So this is one of those on November 23rd. The initial proposal has to be put out uh, for at least 30 days for the public to comment on before it is submitted to NTIA. So November 23rd would probably be the latest date that um, IHI would submit their initial proposal for BEAD for public comment. So I would expect it to be sooner than that. Um, I don't know exactly when, but that is the document that's going to tell us a lot more about the details of how the program is going to be run here in the state. So keeping our eye open for that. Moving on to December 19th, I believe somewhere in that neighborhood is when the state's digital equity plan is due. Now, Ryan, you had sent out in your email 
to everyone to these documents. You had sent them the draft five-year action plan and the draft digital equity plan. So the state already has some drafts that they're asking for input on, um, and they have two very different uh, due dates on there. However, like we said, those two are going to go hand in hand. So it's very helpful to look at them together to get a holistic picture of how my high is going to be running their programs. All right, jumping down to the December 23rd, that is the last date that my high can submit their initial proposal. I'm going to talk in a little bit about how NTIA to make things easier and run a little faster has actually broken that initial proposal document into two different pieces and they can be submitted. Um, one, one can be submitted a little earlier than the other. So we'll talk about that in depth in a minute. What I really want you to, to walk away from today's meeting with is thinking about Q1. Um, sometime in Q1, I've heard Eric Frederick say on multiple occasions, he wants it to be in January. There's going to be a state map that gets put out of the uh, presumed eligible bead locations. And localities can challenge if you believe that you have more bead eligible locations than are indicated on the map. We're gonna talk about that in a little bit. We're putting a date out there of January 1st. That's the probably the absolute soonest it could be. It may end up being later, but it sure doesn't hurt to be prepared <laughs> for a January 1st challenge open. Finally, um, sometime in April, because the state will have completed their digital equity plan and submitted it to NTIA, once that is approved by NTIA, they can then move forward by asking for that second grant for state money for the state to have the capacity to do their programs on digital equity. And so it could be that the state will be planning to submit that grant application to NTIA sometime in April. There's really no action for local communities to take, but um, just to be aware that they may be happening and may be hearing about. I have put the, D, the Digital Equity Act competitive grant applications on here at June 1st really for the purposes of making a short timeline, I think it's very unlikely that it will be opening that soon. We have no indication from NTIA when the competitive grant will open. As I mentioned, that's the third Digital Equity Act program, and that is one where localities, nonprofits, almost any entity <laughs> can apply for five-year funding for a program. Um, that helps bridge the digital divide. And there's a lot of detail around that. I'm not gonna spend so much time on that today, but I do want you to be aware that that is coming down the pipe. Any questions on this timeline before I move to the next slide? All right. There are a couple of key documents um, that you may wanna refer to while you're wading through all of the bead information and the Digital Equity Act. Um, and I have them linked here, Ryan, I will share this, this presentation with you. Um, you're welcome to share it um, with anyone that you like. Um, so the, there's obviously the notice of funding opportunity for bead, which really lays out the big pieces of the, of the program and how it's gonna work for all of the states. The bead five-year action plan, that's a Michigan document, um, again, that's one that Ryan had attached. That's really just setting out a big, painting a big backdrop, a big frame upon which the details of the initial proposal will be hung um, and we'll get more of those details as we go along into the fall this year. The digital equity plan, again, that's that was in the recent email. That's laying out in a similar way, sort of like a framework of how the state is going to run its digital equity programs. There are two documents that haven't come out yet that you want to keep your eye open for. The first is when Michigan has its volume one of the bead initial proposal. Based on a timeline they put in their five-year action plan draft, we are expecting the state is going to put out volume one this fall. Volume one will include how they are going to run that state map and the challenge process for it, which is really important information for everyone on this call. 
So we want to keep our eyes open for that. Volume two is going to lay out exactly how they are going to select subgrant recipients. So also very important. We're expecting that one's going to come out uh, a fair amount later than the volume one, but it still has to be submitted before the end of December. So those are two you're going to keep your eyes peeled for. Now, if you like to if you like to delve into policy analysis and you enjoy reading, you know, eighty page documents like I do, <laughs> um, these next two um, these next two links are documents the NTIA has put out that, that detail what they're expecting from the states as far as how the states are going to run their bead challenge process. Just the challenge, the map, and the challenge. So the first one, the policy, sorry, the process policy notice, that is policy. So that is mandatory. States have to follow that. The next one is a model, a model challenge process that states can choose to follow or not. They can create their own model process. It's really an, a, a way for the NTIA to say, hey states, if you really are not sure what to do for a challenge process, here's a model you could follow. However, uh, my high has indicated they intend to follow this very closely. Uh, I believe what I heard Eric say is with very few modifications. So there may be some modifications, but you can look at that model challenge process and expect to see most of that in my highs, volume one, when it comes out. Finally, ultimately, after this initial pro proposal gets submitted, and then the process of um, the mapping challenge and the application window and sub-grantee selection happens, there will be a final proposal that NOIHA has to submit to NCIA, which says, here's how we ran the program. Here were the sub-grantees we selected. Um, you know, please approve this. And they have to do that within one year of the, of the day when their challenge process starts. So that's a pretty tight timeline to run such a huge grant program. Um, so uh, many states are biting their fingernails right now about how they are going to make sure they have a good program with good controls and good quality, but also get everything done by the deadline. All right, let's talk a little bit more about maximizing the number of locations in your area that qualify for bead funding. So this state mapping challenge is what's going to determine what areas qualify for funding. We don't have the full details yet. Those are, those are gonna be in that initial proposal document. Again, we're expecting that sometime in the fall, maybe September or October. Um, so keep your eyes peeled for that. If you haven't subscribed on the My High website, you can subscribe to um, their updates and their newsletters. I highly recommend that you do that. Um, as I mentioned, this determines which locations qualify for funding. They are required, my high is required to start with the federal broadband map as a starting point. However, NTIA allows the state to clearly articulate up front if there's additional information the state has that they intend to use in their state map. So for instance, my high is has the opportunity to use the um, the infrastructure audit that they conducted and put that information, help that be part of their part of the information in their map. Um, Eric has also um, stated that he intends to um, he intends to consider all locations that have DSL to be underserved. So that's just going to be a blanket change that they're going to make. When they take that federal data, they're going to make a blanket change for all DSL locations. So you're going to see that in there. But other than that, I don't quite know yet. Um, but gosh, it wouldn't hurt if you have a relationship with my high or even to reach out to my high if you have some good local data that you think they should be considering as they create their map. Now would be the time to do that. All right, so here's what we do know about that challenge process based on the NTIA documents. Like I said, I'm expecting it to start as soon as January. Um, they have to publish the base map, the base state map with all the eligible locations. The window for challengers, that would possibly be folks on this call, the window for challengers to submit their challenges has to be at least 14 days long. 
um, the period for um, rebuttal. Uh, so it might be an ISP that you're challenging, um, or it could be the determination like, hey, that's that's not really considered a, a community anchor institution. You know, this isn't uh, categorized correctly. The entity that's going to rebut your challenge has at least 14 days to respond to the challenge. So all in all, the entire process um, has to take less than 120 days. So that's from the time that they open the challenge process to the time when they make those final determinations, they got 120 days. So it's gonna be a short period of time. You might be thinking to yourself, oh, I can see that I'll need to be completely prepared before January 1st, because you don't wanna be doing that work on the fly in January or February, you won't have time. So allowable challenges, what sorts of things could you challenge on that state map. You can challenge availability. So perhaps there's an ISP that says we serve this location or could serve them easily. Um, and you know, you or the resident know, nope, we've tried that we cannot get service to that location. You can challenge speed. So perhaps um, perhaps it's indicated that that location has say fiber or can get fiber easily, but you happen to know that they're well beyond the reach of the existing infrastructure and it would be prohibitively expensive. Um, latency, so how long does it does the ping take to go out and come back? I believe it's um, 100 milliseconds is the bead um, threshold for that. You can challenge, yes, this location can get internet service, but only if they're business. <laughs> and this is a residence, so you can challenge that. You can challenge unreasonable data caps, um, and that is specifically what is unreasonable is called out um, in the NTIA uh, information. You can challenge, the, somebody says that this area has cable, but I know they can only get DSL, so you can challenge the kind of technology. There are two um, kind of unexpected or newer challenges that are also going to be um, uh, on the state level challenge for Michigan. So one is called an area or multi-dwelling unit challenge. I encourage you to look at the model challenge process that NTIA put out and read the specific details on how it talks about that. But in general, um, with the area challenge, if six locations within a census, uh, a census block group um, are, are proven to be um, inaccurate. And it, it could be on any of those things. It could be availability, speed, latency, data caps, on any of those. Um, so if it's a particular technology and a particular provider, and there are six locations in a census block group, then sort of the onus of, of, um, of evidence flips and goes to the provider, then all the locations that are served by that provider in those census block groups is now called into question. And the provider has to prove that they actually do provide service X on technology Q <laughs> to this location and these other locations that they've been claiming. Um, I have a lot of questions about this process. I'm sure you do too. Um, I encourage you to read what is in the NTIA model challenge, um, but we really won't know much more about how my high is going to do that until that initial proposal, volume one comes out. And finally, uh, community anchor institutions eligibility. Um, BEAD gives a lot of leeway to the state to decide how to define community anchor institutions, and uh, BEAD funding can be used to bring gigabit service to CAIs that do not currently have it. And so um, making sure that institutions that actually serve the community um, have that opportunity might be something you also want to look at when you're preparing your challenges. All right, before I move on, does anybody have questions? This is such a complicated uh, piece. Uh, does anybody have questions about this challenge process or anything I shared with you so far? Chris, if we have data on, say, community anchor institutions that we think, um, you know, goes beyond um, what my eye already 
assumes um we should send them to merit maybe is that right i encourage you to send them directly to my high they do have an okay. inbox um we well, really encourage counties to have direct relationships with them great okay and we are developing um some data for my high right now so if, if it was ready to go we could incorporate that and in, in the, the data set we push but I, I agree with Chris that um I think the direct relationship with my high on the data transfer uh, makes it more clean so you know someone's not sharing someone else's information and um those requests too were somewhat related to any existing infrastructure. So your your provider community that may have infrastructure information, um, you know, I think the state will do a spatial analysis on existing infrastructure that could serve uh, anchors, and that's important to the state as well as the the actual address locations that'll help them build their fabric. Thank you for that. Oh. All right. Let's talk about what we know about the subgrant application process. So we don't know much about how My High itself is going to be running it because those details will be in volume two of the initial proposal, which is expected sometime late this year. We do know from the NTIA requirements that they have to use an online portal. Um, it would seem, I would say if I was running My High, I would just want to use something similar to what I used for the Robin program, which was the eGrams system. Uh, if you go to my high's website, it's also linked here. There's a training program on how to use their eGrams system. So if you didn't apply for a Robin grant, but you would like to apply for a bead sub grant, it might be worth your time to go and look at how they ran that Robin program. It might give you a leg up uh, when the time comes to apply for the bead subgrants. Uh, uh, NTIA lays out some really clearly stated priorities over and over again in their guidance documents. They are very um, prejudiced towards fiber optic service. They also are very concerned about cost management. They really want this bead funding to go as far as it can. And so they want to, they're looking for matching funds. They want to minimize the amount of bead funds that are necessary to get the job done. They also emphasize over and over affordability, especially in the monthly cost of subscriptions and fair labor practices. I just want to reiterate again that this whole subgrant program has to be completed within 365 days after the approval of the initial proposal, which is a lot, right? They have to do that mapping challenge. They have to run their application. They have to go through the selection process and they have to put their final proposal out for public comment before they can submit it to NCIA. <laughs> That's a lot to cram into one year. All right, you're probably thinking, oh boy, this is really big. What can I do today? Here's what we're recommending communities do uh, really as soon as possible. Um, you wanna go to the National Broadband Map and download the data that it has about internet availability for locations in your community. Another option is, is if you want to pursue a license uh, for the cost quest fabric, which is the data that underlies that map, you can do that as well. That's um, kind of a laborious process, but you also get a little bit extra information, which can come in handy later. Um, you wanna take a look at that FCC map availability data and compare it to the infrastructure audit data that uh, my high provided now. So if you are with a county or regional planning agency, my high would have sent this to you. I can go look at the date. I want to say it was in April. Um, they sent files to their GIS contacts that they had for each county um, and said, you know, here is some infrastructure audit data for you to do with whatever whatever you see fit. And this would definitely be a fit use for you to be comparing availability and infrastructure. Third, we're recommending that communities begin conversations with your local internet service providers. Um, some counties have been successful in asking their ISPs to share their service area maps, um, provided they have a non-disclosure agreement, right? So you wouldn't be sharing that data outside of the county, but for planning purposes, it would be helpful to know 
what the various service areas are of the existing providers in your area. Um, you want to know about if they have planned expansions coming up, and you might be wanting to feel these, these entities out to see if they might be wanting to partner with your municipality or county or region on a public-private partnership to pursue a BEAT grant, uh, perhaps to serve those areas that are really expensive to build to, or maybe just won't be very profitable, but we do want to get them served. So it's time to begin those conversations. You definitely want to watch that My High website. Watch out for that volume one and read it when it comes out. And we also have a one-hour webinar that we did with um, an organization out of DC. They, they work with folks all over the nation on applying for federal broadband grants. Uh, they're called the Grants Office, LLC. And they partnered with us on this one-hour webinar that's linked here, but it really lays out all the steps. If you if you want to get involved in perhaps a public-private partnership, um, it really lays out all the steps that you want to go through to get ready to submit your application. All right, and finally, I want to tell you about two groups that Merit uh, convenes that you might be interested in. So the first, we have a challenge working group. It's It's a variety of local governments that get together uh, on a monthly basis. We stay on top of what, what the policy changes are. We've been inviting um, the state and the federal government to come tell us about you know, the BEAD program and plans that they have. Um, we get a lot of value out of sharing best practices, about what various entities are doing to prepare for this mapping challenge. As we did with the federal mapping challenge, we plan to, with the state, provide really step-by-step -step instructions to walk through that process as soon as we know what they are. <laughs> we have access to GIS specialists who work all day in broadband, so um, that can be a, an asset as well. So that's our challenge working group. If you're interested, you can email us at that uh, email down at the bottom. We also have a community of practice that is focused on advocacy around broadband equity. So this is a group of local, county, regional leaders, nonprofits, folks who are passionate about bridging the digital divide for Michigan. Um, so it's it's all kinds of different things, right? So it's, it's raising awareness at all those different levels. Uh, we do a lot of work. We, we talk, there's been some some collaborative, some collaborative efforts that have come out of the group. We try to influence policy where we can. Um, so it's it's kind of a higher level. We want to make some some positive change happen in Michigan, and that group meets quarterly. All right, I've run over my time by four minutes, Ryan. I tried to stick to it. <laughs> um, does anybody have any quick questions before I yield the floor? Well, if not, um, I guess I'd ask a question to uh, the group. And um, have you been having any conversations with uh, uh, local partners on creating partnerships, or um, has there been any progress toward or or thinking about bead and and strategizing for uh, how you're going to approach it? So it looks like Charlotte had a share here. Um, let's see. Uh, Michigan Broadband and Digital Equity Summit is happening on November 2nd and 3rd in East Lansing. Well, that's Ryan? kind of, that's a good peer group, Brian. I think that's going to primarily be county government mm -hmm. um, as well as a, a, a good attendance from the, the network operators in the state and in the ISPs. And that's really the entities that need to, you know, be coming together right now. So it's a, a great place to learn best practices, see what see what other counties are doing. It's it's a program that's filled with presentations. And then the second day is more of a working group structure. And I don't think we've landed on exactly what we're going to do in the working group structure, but my guess would be it's going to be state mapping challenge process. Great. Thank you for sharing that. And it also reminds me, um, 
uh, October 18th and 19th, save the date for that up here in the UP. Um, UPCAP is going to be uh, holding a county commissioner's um, um, annual meeting. Um, and uh, I believe Merida is going to be uh, a guest speaker at that as well. So um, maybe an uh, opportunity to connect to uh, local officials and um, try to heighten that priority here. But Corey, I, I think you have something to say. Yeah, I was going to say not in the central UP, but <clears throat> we're working with uh, local municipalities on, on a strategy um, for their region. Um, just anybody on this call, I'd welcome uh, folks that are interested in working with a, with a partner uh, as an ISP. Astria is very interested in, in, in going after this funding all over the UP. Um, in the central UP, of course, would fit in that mold, right? And so Rhea Anderson or I can be reached out to, to, to kick off a conversation, dream a little dream. Um, we're familiar with, you know, subsidy programs like this, uh, past and, and current. And so we'd love to have that conversation. So just an offer. Really appreciate that offer, Corey. All right. Does anyone else have uh, any questions or, or want to share anything? Hey, Brian, this is Trey. Uh, maybe a question for Chris, and it's in respect to the challenge process. Uh, is my high going to provide a specific, and maybe I missed it, and I apologize, but is my high going to provide a specific documentation or procedure for entities, communities, municipalities to do that challenge in January? Is there like, do they have a, are they going to come up with some sort of form or online process that's good. Yes. Yes, there, um, I expect that all the details will be in that volume one, uh, but, but it is, it does have to be an online portal in, into which that information will be captured. Um, so yes, I'm expecting exactly that. Um, and that'll be in that volume one of the initial proposal uh, that my high will be putting out. Don't know exactly when, but sometime in the next, you know, perhaps two to three months. Great, thank you. All right, um, last call for questions or any comments. Well, if not, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Tim and Jason. Here, so um, uh, Tim and Jason are with Empower Innovations, and uh, I guess I'll let them explain uh, what their presentation is all about. Go ahead, guys. Thanks, Ryan, and thank you for uh, giving us this opportunity and working with Tim to uh, get this together. I love being in here, seeing some customers, some folks we've talked to. And really my goal today is just to tell you about a company that's local here and some of the capabilities we have and who knows where that will go. So Empower is a company, this is our office. We're sitting in an Iron Mountain right now, founded in 2016. We are a GIS centered company and the fiber management and some of those broadband solutions are, are new to us, but uh, our people are all utility experience. We've got customers in 36 states and territories, and, and our mission is just to make GIS and some of this network integration technology more affordable and user-friendly so folks that aren't well-versed in the GIS world or well-staffed have tools that will help them and also uh, get them moving in that direction. So just a quick look at our products. The, the primary product that applies to this uh, business unit is Fiber Pro. It is a GIS tool set, that's, tool set that supports the mapping, analytical functions, design functions of a fiber and coax management system. Um, and then Integrator is the product that we started this business on, and there's a lot of work being done with that telecom infrastructure manager. It really provides a, a system of record. And in the GIS world, there's a lot of systems out there that use proprietary databases. 
Uh, we're an Esri business partner. That's kind of, you know, the go-to. Our, our uh, products are based on the Esri Communication Utility Network Foundation. So that's the products going to be out there in the future. That's where things are going to migrate to. Um, go ahead, Tim. So just some of our telecom and fiber solutions. Again, Fiber Pro is our GIS-based product. Uh, I'm going to show you a little three, four minute demo of that just to see what it's all about. You know, we've we've gotten involved with all kinds of field mapping for the asset verification and collection. I'll touch on that. And then data management, whether it's migration, inflation, getting that stuff out of old legacy, legacy system or creating it for the first time. The biggest thing is we're a local Michigan based company. We've got resources and capacity. So if somebody needs help or needs to throw some resources at something, we should talk. Um, the, uh, that slide's a little weird, isn't it, Tim? Anyway, this all got started at a meeting in Iron Mountain where uh, Tom, Steve, we went to a meeting and I met Tom Stevenson and talked about our capabilities. And we got pretty involved with the, uh, with the, uh, Connected Michigan and the, the little map of the Lower Peninsula is the counties that we map that help create some of this broadband fabric and these maps that people are using right now to go after funding. Unfortunately, none of those counties are in the UP. That was all uh, going on. So uh, without uh, further ado, I'll just give you a quick look at the product and what it does. And I'm going to do a recording so I don't have to do this. Taking a look at your, your uh, Empower, Empower Smart Fiber, Fiber Pro, Pro software for fiber management, and it runs as an add-in to ArcGIS Pro. Uh, so we're looking at Fiber Pro right here, and we're looking at this running inside ArcGIS Pro 3.1. We're going to demonstrate splice editing now using the splice editor. So I have my enclosure selected on the map, and now I'm going to click on the splice editor button. And that's going to give me a visual representation of that enclosure. This cable coming from the north is number 45, so we'll just connect that. And just let's connect all of these strands in number 47, which is the one coming out here to the west. Well, two of those are going to pass through here, and then we'll take and we'll jump kind of to the bottom part of our uh, first buffer tube. And let's just draw these across. Um, like this. So at that point, once again, I'm going to save my work, I'm going to clear my selection, and I'm going to close my splice editor. Now I'd like to show tracing. So we have a fiber network here, we have some cables, we have some enclosures, and we've created some splices within those enclosures. I'm going to use this tool to select the cable, the long cable extending west-east here, and now we see that on the map. And now we have also our fiber trace window. We can choose, we can see all the strands in this fiber, and they're also broken down by their buffer tube. The first buffer tube is in blue, the second is in orange. If I select a strand, and then I click the trace button, this will run a trace. I can see my results in the window here. And I can also see my results on the map. And you can see that I've traced downstream from left to right across our network. I can run another trace by just selecting, for example, the second strand, clicking trace, and I can see that that also continues across and up to the north. We could try a trace on a strand in this second buffer tube, this orange buffer tube. And that now shows that the splicing that we've made at this splice enclosure, the one in the center, and this splice enclosure over here to the east is taking our downstream trace all the way across uh, and down to the south. And just for fun, we could trace from this fiber cable, choose one of the strands. And for us, the interesting result here is that we're now tracing upstream. So we're traveling uh, in a reverse direction from this cable, the green cable, 
up through the red cables uh, in the reverse or upstream direction. And again, at the end, if we'd like, we can clear our trace and we can close our fiber trace window. So um, just a little look at the dashboard. This is something that uh, is much improved over our current product. These splice diagrams and reports are all dockable, exportable, and usable by guys in the field. Um, pretty common complaint that some of this product gets with high fiber counts gets very difficult to make sense of, to figure out what's going on. You have to actually look at the data, you know, and with these, we can blow them up, zoom into them and, and really see what's going on, whether it's by fiber, buffer tube, entire cable, and look at what's going on and all of it. Yeah. As mentioned, this is all in the latest Esri Arc Pro and the Utility Network Foundation. So, a little bit of the additional capabilities beyond what was just shown in the demo is the design verification and route optimization all troubleshooting. And a couple of examples of those are, you know, there's your uh, route optimization, or, or sorry, this is the fiber circuit builder. So it tells you where your uh, outside plan is and, and how or the options you have to provide service to a place. Um, this slide um, is more of the uh, road optimization, tracing some of the stuff that uh, was shown in the demo. And, uh, you know, the, the demo, which was just a teaser, uh, on August 29th, we're doing a, a detailed webinar. A lot of people come in, customers, uh, prospects from around the country. And uh, you can find that on our website or the link to register for that is uh, right there at EmpowerInnovations.com. Welcome anybody to sit in and learn more. Welcome to talk to anyone or share some of this product and capabilities or our product capabilities and capacity with anyone that would like to talk. Anybody have any questions, comments, things that uh, strike a nerve? Well, we appreciate the opportunity to show what we're all about and look forward to talking to some of you folks in the future. Thank you very much, Tim and Jason. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, glad to have a, a local partner uh, join us and, and share. So, um, well, with that, um, I think we're at the end of... Uh, our, our content here for today but again just wanted to thank um chris and and um the guys over at empower innovations um uh, for for joining us and um we'll be sharing out information after this um along with the presentation um uh, we record the presentation and include it on the broadband task force website um uh, and so uh, if you want to share that with anyone in your um, circle, then please uh, feel free to link that to them. So, and then uh, Chris just dropped uh, her email address in the chat, um, and uh, we'll make sure that goes out with everything too. So, um, thanks all for your time. Um, appreciate it, and um, we'll see you at the next one. Have a good weekend. Bye. Sounds good. Thanks. We'll see you, everybody. Bye. 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 Take yep. care. Thank you.